what's some of the more exciting parts to either write or record? And I'm sure this is open to both of you. I'm sure this is probably a bit like, I don't know, when people ask Paul, what's your favorite song? He goes, I thought like all my kids, that type of thing, or John, his favorite song, et cetera. Um, so it might be a little bit like that, but just trying to figure out, you know, what are some of the favorite parts, at least so far in the series, some favorite standout memories that either of you have? Uh, Jude, I guess we could start with you first and then go back to Scott. Well, my favorites are telling stories that haven't been told before from people who were there. Um, in the next book, which Scott and I would like to record, uh, should have known better. It's volume four, uh, which is 1964. I got to know a gentleman named John Trusty, who just happened to be at the Naval base when the Beatles had to uh, miss Jacksonville because of the Hurricane Dora and go down to Key West and hang out until the winds were not so dangerous. And they stayed very close to a Naval base and they went to the bar that all the Navy men went to. And John happened to be there that night and the Beatles were there along with the exciters and everybody that was on the tour. And so he had a conversation with John Lennon at the bar. John, he did not start the conversation with John. John started the conversation with him and actually made it seem like he kind of wanted to hang out with him that night. And John, being a, a Navy man and very, you know, night, early, late 1950s, early 1960s, what straight and narrow, which would have been a completely different lifestyle than from today. John looked at him and said, care for a fag? And John, and John Trusty said, uh, oh, no, I'm just here for the chicks. <laughs> Meaning cigarette, of course, in the English slang, yes. He had no idea yeah. what John was talking about, very nervous about the whole thing. And then John started laughing and just kind of walked away. And he's like, oh, I lost my opportunity to hang out with John Lennon. I'm so stupid. I'm so stupid. And his whole story, it's just the cutest story because he he interacts with Paul and interacts with George and Ringo. And, and, there's, it, and it culminates in the care for a fact comment but i love telling that story in the new book that's coming out some forever Lori freckleton was at the chicago concert and it's the story of how she convinced her parents to let her and, and a couple of other girls go to the concert unchaperoned how they put money into an envelope and sent the money i mean coins and sent the money in to get their tickets you have a glimpse into a world that we would that we can't even imagine anymore. You know, a world that doesn't exist at all anymore through the eyes of these people who were there. Ivor Davis, who toured with the Beatles in 1964 and was one of two people to be with them on the night they met Elvis. One of two. They didn't take news people, photographers in with them. Chris Hutchins. And Ira Davis got to be the two that went in with them to meet Elvis. And to tell his story of what it was like in that room when they met Elvis, I love to tell the stories of the people who were there. That's my, that's number one, my favorite thing, because so much is up to interpretation 50 and 60 years after the fact. But when you're talking to someone who was actually there the night that Stu was kicked in the head, behind either Litherland or Latham Hall. It's still, you know, up for grabs, which one it was. And John breaking his finger, defending Stu and all that. When you talk to people who were there, you know you're walking on the right path. You know that you're walking the path of truth because this is, they were there. So I, I love doing that. That's my favorite by far. And maybe going a slight bit off topic, funny enough, when you when you bring that up and that's, even in the anthology, watching it, you know, from my perspective, when it's you know on VHS later DVD, et cetera, watching it when you get to that part, and you get the idea that oh, yeah, John jammed with Elvis, and then Paul's like, no, I don't remember jamming with Elvis. I remember this. Ringo's like, I remember this. George is like, oh, I was just trying to see if they had any, uh, you know, fun stuff with them, so to so to speak, <laughs> trying to keep it family friendly here. But uh, you can read between the lines with that one. That's just it, you know, all those interpretations. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about trying to keep as truthful as possible to the story. Yeah. And that that was the Elvis meeting. I, I have more notes on the Elvis meeting than any chapter I've ever written. I think I ended up over over 80 pages of type notes. And 
everybody disagreed with everybody about everything. In fact, I'm going to make a schematic at the back of the chapter on who said what, because they disagree on literally everything. But the one thing I finally figured out was why John and Paul thought they jammed and George and Ringo said they did not, because as you just pointed out, George left the room in search of things and Ringo had was playing snooker with the Memphis Mafia. So they weren't in the room when the jamming took place. So and but John and Paul both vehemently disagree about what songs they played. Paul has a list, John has a list, and never the twain shall meet. It just is, you know, it, I, I, Scott's probably tired of hearing me say this, but do you remember that story about the five blind men and the elephant, Edward? I've, yes, that story where they're each trying to describe an ear, an eye, a tusk. What is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's a big fanned out thing. Oh no, it's a real scrawny, wiry thing. Yeah, you know, they're all in different positions. And that's how it is in these stories. You know, Mal is telling it from his perspective. Alf Bicknell is telling it from his perspective. Ivor's telling it from his perspective. The Beatles, John's so nervous, he's not even talking in his own voice. He's doing Peter Sellers, you know? So, um it, it's interesting how the truth is malleable according to who's who's viewing what's going on. Yeah, like Rashomon, like that that type of thing. You see one event, we have 50 different recollections of it. No, nope, totally, right. I totally, totally get that. And Scott, I guess a bit of that to you as well with that kind of question, you know, some of the more interesting parts to say voiceover as well. Or yeah, so of. Scott, uh, continuing on uh, the question I asked with uh, Jude, of course, about the most exciting parts to, uh, you know, kind of write and record. What were some of the more uh, exciting parts for you to kind of record during the series and some of the highlights for you as well? Well, for the recording part, um, the moment that I uh, liked the most was the night that I recorded the, um, the Beatles traveling to America for the first time on the jet. Now, I, I, I'd i read the, the whole book before I, I record. I always read the book before. But uh, I um, when I'm recording, and I know I'm going to be recording the book, unless it's a subject matter that I don't know, in which case I'll read it very carefully ahead of time, in order to keep some of the energy and the enjoyment for myself, I won't overread it so that it's a bit more fresh to me. I'll make sure that I know it well enough so that I don't um, ham fist sentences every uh, three lines, because otherwise it'll take forever to record. But um, uh, it keeps some of the freshness. And so the, the chapter on them not having any idea at all how many people were going to be in the US, the writing itself was exciting. And all I was doing was channeling that and it felt wonderful. So and it was one of the longest chapters in the book. And I just remember the one night that I spent like from midnight to three in the morning or however it long to record that chapter. Might have been even longer. I don't remember. But um, it was um, it was a quite fun recording session. Very much so. It just uh, yeah, I, I really did enjoy that. Oh, excellent. It's, it's and always... um one of the things I'm looking forward to recording, which I haven't mentioned to Jude yet, was that in the next book, um, A Hard Day's Night is one of my all-time favorite movies, if not my favorite of all time. I think I've bought it in every version that's come out, except maybe not Betamax. But otherwise, uh, I keep buying it again and again and again, you know, VHS, Blu-ray, Blu-ray, the unofficial one from Spain, and then the official Blu-ray one from the Criterion Collection, and, and et cetera. Anyway, um, I'm looking forward to uh, promoting it, doing a few things with A Hard Day's Night, and hopefully coming up with a couple of different uh, approaches to it that Jean, uh, Jude might not know about. So, um, I'm really looking forward to the next book in particular. <laughs> Well, wow, you know, a little, little exclusive. I love that. Thank you. No, thank you for, for sharing. Well, that. Uh, one of the things I'm doing, I, I'm working on a history book right now, and it's um, nothing to do with the Beatles, but um, I'm, I think I've really done a really good job on it. 
it's about the best that I can do with what I already know. So that whole length of time here between Jude's book and the next Jude book, I think has been worthwhile for me to get a little more up to speed, hopefully a little more quick in my turnaround time for doing editing of the audio, which takes much longer than it does to record. And as you probably know, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also trying to do and learn a new few tricks of the trade, as it were. Oh, yes. I know that's, yeah, you know, that's um, more than I intended to say, but. No, no, that's fine. This, this, this is absolutely, no, this is absolutely good to, you know, to, to keep the conversation flowing, of course. And, you know, yes, you said, you know, even editing something like this, you know, editing an interview, editing something I could certainly relate with learning a new skill. And uh, you know what? It's it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, that leads me to another question. I hadn't quite thought of, but I'll go ahead and extend that out to you. Uh, so, Jude, what type of new skills have you learned during this whole time, during this whole process of writing these books, skills that you might not have had before? Um, gosh, so much, so much. I keep a note. Let's see. I think I have it right here. I keep notes on expressions for the book um, because as I listen to people speak, as I read other books, as I, I mean, something just as simple as with Sinister Delight. Um, I, you know, anytime that I hear someone say something, and John Lennon used to do the same thing. He kept notes in his left pocket that he wanted to use in his writing. And when he had used it, then he transferred it over to his right pocket. But um, I am constantly trying to use new words, caterwauling, and um, John flashed a madman's grin, lackadaisical. I, have, I, I constantly am scribbling things down and saving them so that the writing stays fresh. Um, economy, I was really bad at that at the beginning. I would, I would use a long phrase when one word could do. So when I go back, I, I edit probably 10 or 15 times before I, I let Fran edit it. And then we send it on to Janet. Um, and we're being joined this time by Ken Bloom, who edited volumes one and two, um, is coming back to edit this time as well. But before they ever see it, you know, I've changed it and changed it and changed it and changed it. In fact, let's see, I'll show you what a chapter looks like after I get into it. Um, okay, so here's just a typical page. I don't know if you can see all the yeah, I think we can see that on the camera. Kind of the kind of rough the rough idea and the rough notes and everything. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So yeah. I do a lot of changing and I'm trying to work towards economy of language using one good word instead of 15 so so words. Um I'm trying to um give people more conversation and instead of me describing something to them because the, the the Beatles words say it better than I can ever say it. So the more we can rely on firsthand commentary instead of my description, I'm trying to do more of that. It, it is every day I learn something new, every single day. And that is thanks to all the people whose books are around me. I mean, I could not have written the Australian experience in 1964 without Jim Birkenstadt. I could not write these chapters on the music of the Beatles without Womack, Spicer, uh, Tim Riley's Tell Me Why, um, gosh, Walter Everett, um, Jerry Hammock, the recording Beatles recording reference guide, um, Robert Rodriguez. Uh, you can just go on and on and on and on. These people know their area, and I know nothing about Beatles music other than I love it. So when I, we've, I've been in EMI for the last probably two months of my life trying to get Rubber Soul recorded. And I'm like, what do they mean when they say they put it through a series of faders? What does that mean? What is a series of faders? And so every day I'm learning more and more and more about the technical side of the Beatles. And um, so I have to question and ask and get people to help me. And it's all about reaching out. And it hopefully I'm improving and it's not getting worse. But yeah, I try every day to do something new and learn something new. 
that's the goal of life. That's the goal of, of, of all of us, you know, and I think, um, you know, especially all the different lives that, you know, John lived within 40 years, he lived so many different lives. Like, you know, for example, when I was reading, particularly, you know, again, particularly, I don't plug in this, but, you know, plugging this again, plugging this volume, particular volume I have, you know, there's an interesting uh, page 610 I marked out. I was, you know, thumbing through that. It's 1965. John's in the house getting up. He's expected to, to kind of prepare the food for him versus one of his interviews from 1977, when he's going on about the first Polaroid of him baking bread, kind of the change and the shift in perspective, in years, in attitudes. Um, and I think that's really interesting in and of itself. I mean, how, you know, how do you capture it all? How do you capture this whole 40 years? It's probably much more than many of us might live in a lifetime. Just all the experiences, the different phases, the different looks he had, everything. Um and Philip uh, Norman. In John Lennon, The Life, Philip Norman recounts the story of John saying to Yoko right after they got together, okay, well, you have to understand women serve me. Uh, Mimi waited on me. Cynthia waited on me. You'll need to clean up my room and you'll need to make food for me and make sure my clothes are taken care of and everything. And she said, oh, there's only one thing for that. I'll leave. <laughs> She wasn't about to do that. And so people that say, oh, Yoko followed him everywhere he went and she was constantly uh, yeah, at his heels and she followed him into the studio. Oh, oh no, you got that wrong. Yoko did not follow John. John then said, oh no, you can't leave me. I can't be left again. This can't happen. So he started bringing her everywhere with him. He no longer wanted her to clean his clothes or make his food. Suddenly it was fine for him to, to make something for breakfast. And it was fine. And he was bringing her with him because he didn't want to be left behind again, the way his mother had left him when he was four and a half. So um, it's Philip Norman really opened my eyes to how that, that change came about. Oh, yeah. Well, even uh, one of the guests, the previous guest I had, uh, Madeline Baccaro, she does uh, her, her Yoko, uh, you know, biography, who I got to meet at the fest and, and inter interview just a little short time ago. Uh, it's a very interesting perspective. So there's all these pieces of the puzzle. Um, now, Scott, in speaking of pieces of the puzzle, so like when you're getting all these different pieces together, I'm assuming when you're recording the book, yes. it's, it's not quite chronological that you're doing the book. How do you kind of keep track of all the different pieces, all the different pieces of the puzzle, kind of preparing yourself for, you know, a voice recording session? I've got um, tags saved for the different voices. And so I'll have a go-to that I will play again and again and again before I record that specific voice. So even though I recorded, um, I more or less record the entire book in order um, of the chapters, but I go back to do um, either what they call pickup lines, which are lines that I've flubbed, I've got a wrong word in there, I've said something wrong, especially if it's in French, and I'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> or um, I'll want to revoice something that I know could be better, should be better. And so those are the ones that uh, I'll go back and tackle again. So, for instance, the Beatles, uh, the first Christmas record, uh, where all four Beatles are, um, you know, riffing on the original script, right? And um, so I did that whole thing in one take because I more or less had it memorized from just listening to it over the decades for so many years, ever since somebody... Oh, it was so sweet to play it on the radio and then, you know, you tape record it and then you play it all year long and then your family doesn't want anything to do with you after that point. And uh, anyway, so I did all of that, but I, I knew that it could be better and should be better. So I went back and I did some pickups around there and I even did some uh, little multi-track editing so that the voices would actually interrupt each other. And uh, so wondering if people listening would suddenly catch that, like, wait a minute, they spoke at the same time. How did he do that? Excellent. Not, not too frequently. It is so good. I know when I'm doing a good job, when I don't do it as a multi-track and I have one of the voices interrupt the other and it sounds like it's an interruption. That's when I'm very pleased with the job that I did. Excellent. Excellent. Well, kind of a final question and sort of a Sorry, wrap up phase of the interview. No, no, wrap up phase or interview, but just to uh now this is one I'm 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 guessing this might be a no, but let's let's just go for it anyways. 
Uh, so I know, like speaking with Madeline, for instance, with the Yoko Ono book, Sean and Yoko are aware of the series or aware of the book itself, rather. Uh, do you know if either Sean or Yoko or anybody officially affiliated with the Beatles is kind of aware of the series, has commented on the series, or just kind of curi more of a curiosity question? Well, of course, Julia Baird has, you know, she's well aware of it. She has the books and she's been very kind to help me and she she knows about it 100%. Uh, and I've talked about Louise already and Louise Harrison and Angie and Ruth both. And they were very kind. They just had us on two flicks Tuesdays this past week. And yeah, they've been very supportive and helpful. Um, Yoko, I'm sure she knows everything. And I'm sure that she's very well aware of it, but I'm not up to her part yet. And I've got my hands full just with 1965 much less, you know, looking ahead. Um, but I, I, I feel certain that she does know about it. I have not reached out yet, but she has been extremely gracious to Jim Birkenstadt and has helped him with his work. And I, and I don't anticipate her being anything but gracious. Um, May Pang certainly knows she has copies of all the books and she and I, I consider May to be a dear friend. And she knows, you know, what's going on. Um, I, you know, other than that, all of the other people were friends, professors, early band members, um, of course, the first managers of the Beatles. I'm good friends with Pete and Rogue and just yeah, everyone else in Liverpool and London and who work with the Beatles in the States has been wonderful, but I'm just trying to take it in my, I stay in my time frame. And I, the only times that I've done interviews that are not in my time frame are when I, you know, reached out to people that I did not think would be around when I got to that time frame, And you know, thankfully I did, because by the time that I got to them, they, they weren't with us any longer, but I try to really immerse myself in where I am at that point. Excellent. No, thank you. And just want to say, of course, you know, again, getting the Beatles history as accurate as possible. And there may never be a point where it's a hundred thousand percent accurate, but as close as possible for certainly for, you know, the, all the different generations too, you know, the the boomers out there, the Gen X like myself, the millennials, Gen Z, people that are going to be coming afterwards. And I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Jude, for your work. Scott, definitely for your work, for your voiceover work. So I just... All right, folks. Well, that was it. Um, now, normally at this point in the video, obviously, we would have had them uh, themselves doing the uh, you know, websites and links for both Jude and Scott. Uh, ran into a couple technical di technical difficulties. See, even I do it. Uh, technical difficulties, that's why, of course, uh, I'm filming this outro. I really enjoyed having both Jude and Scott on. You are both welcome back anytime. It doesn't matter how many times. Anytime, you're welcome back. A very uh, interesting interview. Uh, I'm glad to have been able to show both parts of this. So go ahead and uh, look below in the links, and you'll see uh, the links how to outreach Jude, how to outreach Scott. Uh, definitely, you know, buy her books, and of course with Scott, hire him for any project. Um, you know, and I, uh, I highly recommend both. It was such a joy, and uh, I'll make sure to uh, catch everybody in the next video. So uh, until then, be safe.